So for all you new Bible owners, I think they all left. All right. For all you old Bible owners, here we go. You know, the greatest thing about this scripture, I love, love, love reading this scripture. And, you know, years into my faith, I always saw myself as one of the 99 dumb ones grazing while the shepherd walked away. And once in a while, I get that, that realization that there was a time and sometimes there is again when I'm that one that wandered off. So Luke 15, chapter 1 through 10, verses 1 through 10. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him, and the Pharisees and scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or that one woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. It hasn't been very long in Atascadero since school started. And so I know some of you have had the experience of dropping your children off at school. Some of us remember dropping children off at school, and some of us may even remember the first time we were dropped off at school. I always remember at this time of year the, the moment I took our oldest daughter to kindergarten for the first time. She'd been in preschool, so she was used to being dropped off, but she had not been dropped off at this school before. And the preschool was small, and the teachers were multiple, and they were always right there ready to, you know, deal with each child individually. The kindergarten class had over 30 children assigned to be in it. So when we walked in the class, there was this mad chaos because most of those 30 children had at least one parent with them. Some of them had both parents with them, and there was just a terrible noise of people talking. Some of the kids were crying. Everybody was trying to tell them they were going to be all right, but some of the parents looked like they were crying and needed to be told they were going to be all right. And there was just this absolute chaos. I remember standing in the door and thinking, this can't be happening. There, <laughs> this isn't going to work. And I thought, how is this one teacher going to get control of this madness and actually teach these kids something. Well, she was an experienced teacher, and so after a few moments of letting us get used to this, she announced loudly but kindly, it's time for you parents to go. <laughs> she said, your children will be all right. In fact, they will probably be better when you are out of the room. So one last kiss and hug, and then please leave the classroom. So she got us all out of there, and as I was walking away, I thought, how's she going to do it? 30 kids, by now most of them were crying. If they weren't unhappy to begin with, you know, going through that kind of introduction was making them cry. And they came home, and you know what? All of us survived that day. It, it worked. But I want you to think in terms of this scripture, if that kindergarten teacher had gotten control of her class, expecting 30 of them, looked at the sign-in sheet, counted the noses, and said, oh no, only 29 of them are here. And they all signed in. One of them is gone. What would you think of a teacher who said, I'm going to leave these 29 kindergartners who are crying and sobbing and hysterical and don't know where they are, and I'm going to go look for the other ones. So you guys hang out here, and I'll be back in a while. It might take me 10 minutes, 15 minutes to find this kid. You'll be all right. 
That's not what we do, right? <laughs> that isn't the way it works. In fact, somebody would say that was a very foolish thing to do. What kind of a fool would leave a classroom alone like that? That teacher would have had to call for help, right? And, and in the true story, she actually did have a helper. She had an aide, which was a very good idea. But, but you would have to get help because you're not going to leave 29 kindergartners alone in a room. It just isn't a good idea. Well, Jesus is talking to a crowd that's been following him. And some of them are shepherds. If they're not shepherds, they know shepherds. And he starts into this story. He says, which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness, remember they're not in a sheep pen, they are in the wilderness, and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. Well, these folks are going to look at him and go, what kind of fool are we talking about? We don't do that. We don't leave 99 sheep alone in the wilderness because when you come back, you are going to find 99 other sheep that are now lost or in desperate need of a shepherd. So they would have said, no, that doesn't happen. Now, there's a couple different ways that shepherd could work. A hundred sheep is a lot, so if, if one person owns those, this is a wealthy person, and he may indeed send one shepherd out into the field with his sheep. But that sheep, that shepherd, has to account for all of those sheep. If one gets lost, he in fact is going to have to go find some evidence of what happened to it. He will be expected to bring back the skin if a wolf got it, but he has to prove that he knows what happened to that sheep. But he's not likely going to leave 99 to wander off and get themselves killed while he looks for it. He's going to have to take those 99 home and come back and find the one. There's another way to do this, though. Poor people living together in villages would often share sheep. They would have a, a communal flock. So they might have a hundred sheep, and each one is, in fact, very, very important to that community. They likely sent out several sheep herders with their flock, and if one got lost, the rest of them, the rest of the shepherds would take all of those sheep home. The 99 go home, and the one shepherd will continue to search diligently for this one sheep. When he finds it, the village has already been alerted that there is a sheep missing. One of our shepherds is still out there, and they are likely anxious to know, did we get it? Do we have them all? So you can imagine the community now standing together and watching as the shepherd emerges from the hills with a sheep draped over his shoulders, and the sheep is alive, and the community rejoices. This is an awesome thing that this sheep has been found. So then Jesus goes into this other story about a woman. She's got 10 coins, 10 silver coins, which means they're probably called a drachma, and that was worth about a day's labor for a, an average laborer. So she's got 10 of them. We don't know. Are these the only coins she has in her life? We do know that a lot of the poorer people lived, as people do now, on a very meager existence. So a day's pay is significant because that's going to get you to tomorrow. And if you only have, you know, 10, you need to be sure that you can account for those. So a rich person may lose one coin but has other resources and may search for it a little bit and then say, mm, well, it'll turn up or maybe it won't, it's okay. But a poor person is going to search hard. But the question that comes for this woman is, if you lost something that was valuable to you, but you didn't have much to begin with, would you call all your neighbors and throw a party and spend that money you just found on entertaining folks? <laughs> Probably not. But in a poor community, where people know how important that coin was to her, they may have been praying for her that she finds that coin. They may have been worried about her, and indeed they may gather together when they hear she has found it to celebrate. It's interesting that Jesus chooses a shepherd and a woman in this story. I want you to think about how this begins. All the tax collectors and sinners 
were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. Well, here's the thing. In those days, it was a little bit different from how we do church here. A sinner was someone who had clearly made a mistake, done a wrong thing, and the church would push them out. If you were doing something that labeled you a sinner, you would not be welcome in this congregation until you had mended your ways and done the ritual things necessary to get back in the good graces of the church. So for them, sinners were outcasts. They were pushing them out. And eating with people was a clear sign in those days that you accepted them, that you sat at the table with somebody meant you thought they were just fine. So here are the religious authorities saying, this, this Jesus, here are all these sinners and tax collectors. They're probably worse than sinners because they're conspiring with the empire and sometimes extorting money from people. These tax collectors and sinners are following him around and he is eating with them. It's horrifying to them. And, you know, before we get too hard on them, think about it. If your child starts keeping company with someone that you think is a bad person or does bad things, don't we want to protect them? Don't we want to say, hey, don't you, we don't want you associating with that person. That's what it was like. We don't want to associate with the people that are doing the wrong things. So they're grumbling. And it's easy for us to grumble, isn't it? When things don't look right to us, when things don't go our way, we can grumble over lots of things. But these folks are grumbling over religious rules. I mean, this is important to them. And they say he is wrong for doing this. So in response to hearing this grumbling, he tells a story about a shepherd and a woman who were probably two of the poorer categories of that time. They are people that just, you know, the women didn't always get to come in and worship the way the men did, and the shepherds never got to come in. And, and they were sort of the outcasts. And Jesus tells this story as if this is the kingdom of heaven. He said, just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Notice the word 99. We're back to the sheep again, aren't we? <laughs> that we are like sheep and one of us has gone astray and the other 99, well, if they don't need the shepherd's help, let them just stay there. This is directed back to the original, you know, to the religious authorities. He's saying, if you haven't done anything wrong, if you're fine, go ahead and just wander around a bit. It's okay, but I'm going to go look for the one that's out there the one that's not invited back in. And I'm going to find that one. And when I do, even if you folks won't rejoice, there's going to be so much joy in heaven because that's the way God is. Now, it's interesting to think about that because we are a pretty welcoming church. Every time somebody new comes and I ask them, were you welcomed? They always say, yes, people are so friendly here. But it's good for us to think about, is there anybody we wouldn't welcome? Who are the sheep in our community that are out there that God's looking for, but maybe we aren't yet? Because that's the kind of story Jesus is telling. God's out there looking. And there's a message for those of us that feel like we're in the 99. Rochelle said, you know, sometimes she feels like she's the 99, sometimes she's the one. It's easy for us to feel like we are among the 99. We don't need this sometimes. And it's hard for us sometimes. We don't like the word sin in our culture today. But it means, as I've said before, missing the mark. And that means we've all missed the mark. But what Jesus is saying is he's not coming to the 99 that don't feel lost. He's looking for the one that's lost. So if you want to be found... Get lost, right? <laughs> now, I'm not encouraging that you go and do something bad so Jesus will look for you. I am encouraging us to think hard about who we are in all the ways, big and little, that we miss the mark sometimes, that we mess up. Jesus looks for us 
when we're doing that. And sometimes we don't like to think about it. We close it off and, and say, oh, well, I'm a good person most of the time. I don't have to think about that. But this story is, is hopeful and encouraging that we do look at those things because it says that Jesus looks for us when we are lost. And if we never think that we're lost, we're never going to say we need to be found. And then you miss the joy of knowing that Jesus is always out there searching us out and saying, pay attention, I'll bring you home. Amen.